And you all know that, uh, let me tell you something about the ashram. You know that Mahatma lived here for more than 12 years. <coughs> so it, in a way it's a heritage building. Uh, we would like to initiate such a discussion. So this is the first program that people from di different disciplines, you know, comes here and interact with uh, various uh, topics related to Mahatma Gandhi. So this is the, I think, the second lecture which we are uh, organizing for Sabarmati Lecture 2. Uh, first, I formally uh, welcome uh, Mark for this and I request uh, Sudarshan Bhai to give a quick background and introduction about Mark and then he will speak. Sudarshan Bhai. Morning everybody. तो समझो जो कि गुजराती लगभग बदन समझ पड़े चाहे कारण ऐसे कि मार अंग्रेजी में बोलवाना चाहे इतने उन जगह गुजराती में भूमि का मुक्ति दबोए इतने साम पड़े चाहे मार चाहे कि संगीत नो मास्टर चाहे मूल तो ये विज्ञानी चाहे पश्चिम ने आर्थ शास्त्र में दखल करी पश्चिम ने गांधी में दखल गिरी करी आलोकों ने जीवन में कहीं कहीं सूझे इतने नवा दखल के लिए शुरू करें ना पची करें इतने वो पाकू करें इतने गांधी जी जर में घड़ा उंडा होते आ चें मार चें तो विद्या पीठ में लगभग अब छोए पुरुष की तरह रह चें जो उन्हें लगे चें अने जीवन में कोते इतने ये प्रोफेसर चें ने मोटा प्रोफेसर हता� उपचारे उल्लेखा हम अपने कुल वाचिए मां कबर पड़ी है ये मुद्दों ना थी मुद्दों ऐसे के विद्या पीठ मां के क्या ही पढ़े जा रहता हो ऐसे तेरे जा फरता हो ना तेरे लेंगा जब बामा होए इतने समय तो हम भूल खाई जाओ क्या कोई कार्य कर चें परे इतने इतनी आखी मानसिक भूमिका नहीं अंदर सरल साधु जीवन � मैं मने जरा काम करवानी तक आपो भाड़ूए भाग्य मानता हूँ जी मानगी वाती पोते पसार था ये ला हम तो जीवन मानगी के वह ऐसी गति पर मां से निकल जाएगा गांधी जी ना विचारों में गांधी जी ना जीवन ऊपर उन्दा जरे अपने अभ्यास शुरू करें तेरे आरोग्य विषय कौन इन्हें विचारों जाने आकर पश्चिम बधाई उन्� गांधी जी ना आरोग्य विषय ना विचारों में अपने मात्र आरोग्य नहीं चाली तो अपने समझता होने चाहिए पर मोहन छे ये बनवा गयो इंग्लैंड अच्छे अफ्रीका बैरिस्टर मोहन गया यार अच्छे उन्हें बाड़ा पुनी ये सुशुंशा करी ये बदनामी अंदर आरोग्य विषय गांधी ये समझ केल गए चाहिए अगर उसे ना अभ्यासों के लिए ना उपयोग करें जो गांधी ये एम्पार्ट की वजह से मैं मने हूँ तो वही कई शक्ति हैं ये वह हूँ तो वही ना पढ़े हैं घना करें हैं पर ये वो कैसे कि हूँ जब वो हूँ तो वही चुन ये वह मुख्य धारा ना जे तभी बोल चाहे लोगों पर हूँ तो वही तो करें जो तुम एकलो हंसी हैं समाज के लिए इतने समय जोशो तो गांधी को आरोग्य विषय में समझ अने इना सिद्धांतो अने नो अभ्यास के भी रीते धीमे 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 प्रफुल्लित है अच्छे ये मार्ग ना जना व्याख्यान नो विषय ची इनी साथे साथे ये जोड़ा मार्ग ऐसे के आज नहीं आ रहा कि नहीं कोई स्थिति शूज अने ये वो उत्तर कई रहे ऐसे के हम आमा जैसे के नीति विषय कोई बात करी शक्तु नहीं कारण के हम तो विदेशी मानस चों इसलिए हवे हैं फांसो मारा ऊपर ना खेलो जो कि आ काम करे करवाने से इसलिए आपने भी मारे पड़ा आरोग्य � मैं पढ़ थोड़ा व्याख्या निकलें ऐसे ही बुरुखरू 
with some articles by Sudarsh Shambhai. This talk will provide an abstract group commentary and at the end, a few suggestions with regard to the healthcare system in my homeland, the US. It is not for me to suggest what might be done in India. Some of you may initiate or promote well-informed Indian suggestions. Here's a list of what my account of Gandhi on Health describes. Two pivotal times in his life, in 1888 and again in 1908-09, when he wanted to earn an MD degree and become a professional doctor. The evidence from 1908-09 came to light just a few years ago and is absolutely unequivocal. On his way to London in 1909, he expected to remain there and study medicine and earn an MD degree. The reason why he didn't do the studying and get the degree was that he found out in London in 1909 that live frogs would have to be dissected in order for him to learn physiology. So I recoiled in horror from it. An underlying intention of his in 1908-09 was to focus, even in his studies for the MD degree, on nature cure which had, he later mentioned, engaged his interest already by 1906. According to Haralal's granddaughter, Nilan Parikh, that interest had been due to Haralal's father-in-law having given Gandhi two substantial books on nature cure. I will describe later some of the ideas in those books. It seems clear to me that Gandhi's hefty critique in his Swaraj of Western doctors was due to sour grapes about being unable to follow through and earn the MD degree. On the ship taking him back in 1909 to Africa, he wrote that pamphlet in such a fit of passion that when his right hand became cramped, he would write the next page left-handedly. The handwriting slam. Gandhi scholars know that the main secular ideal with which he inspired himself and his sons was that of rendering service to other people. Healing is obviously a great way to do it. So now, evidence that after deciding not to become a doctor, he nonetheless administered medical treatments throughout the rest of his life. The evidence is overwhelming and shows that his vocation for health care was deeper than fortuitous prudence, which he had studied not because it was attractive to him, but only for the sake of becoming qualified to become a people, unlike his father. It was for the money. This picture represents a big part of his adult life, not an auxiliary part. some successful treatments administered by him. We have, of course, no statistics, but there are some well-documented and impressive anecdotes. For instance, of his cure of Kasturba's dire sickness, which the doctor had diagnosed as new pernicious anemia. His cure in 1912 of Raji money by Patel's rheumatism. And in 1930, his cure of his personal cook, Datova, had her out of prison. Datova said, I have been bothered by this pain for years, and now look how much better my foot is. I find no difficulty in walking, whatever. I find it so surprising to be able to walk like other men. Gandhi's physical resilience, for example, in some of the fasts, was superb. And it seems clear to me that he could stoke up physical resilience in others, especially when the treatments were intimate. For instance, administering an enema, examining carefully the stool, and then cleaning the patient himself. Maybe one reason for the good psychosomatic effect was that he would take no fee. His determination that the person he was treating so intensively must get well was crystal clear in cases where the treatment was intimate. Evidence of an incipient, though shallow, interest in modern chemistry, modern in those days, of course. He owned in the early 1930s 10 substantial books on chemistry, but he never gave more than a few bits of what they could teach. 
His chemistry teacher back in secondary school had been appalling, giving him lists of long words to memorize without explaining their meanings or without ever demonstrating anything. At least he knew that he didn't know. That is what this picture seems. Examples of how he used the words quackery and quack. Some of the examples are amusing, and the citations when taken together reveal, in my humble opinion, a problem of cognitive dissonance in his attitudes, especially during the first two decades of the 20th century. In 1908, in an essay about a crime wave published in Gujarati, our duty in regard to social strife is to search out the hidden causes and suggest permanent remedies. It is quackery, vaido, to apply ointment to a boil. The infection should be traced to its source and effectively treated. That is quackery. 1909, in a letter to an Englishman, I accepted the invitation of the Peace and Arbitration Society to speak to them on East and West. It came off last night. The following are the conclusions, blah, 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 blah. Quackery is infinitely preferable to what passes for high medical skill. 1908, in an ethical, uh, sorry, 1912 and 13, in letters to Gokhale. One word from the quack physician, Gandhi himself. Ample fasting, strict adherence to two meals, entire absence of condiments, blah, 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 blah. This is just from one of the letters. This was 1912 to 13. Gokhale died in 1915 at the age of 49. In 1913, in the concluding chapter of a book-length essay in Gujarati on health, Western medical science is based on inconclusive experiments, most of it is quackery. In 1921, in a speech inaugurating a national medical college oriented primarily toward traditional Muslim Unani practices, I have nothing but praise for the zeal, industry, and sacrifice that have animated the modern Western scientists in the pursuit after truth. I regret to have to record my opinion, based on considerable experience, that our Hakims and Baiis do not exhibit that spirit in any mentionable degree. They follow without question formulas. They carry on little investigation. The condition of indigenous medicine is truly deplorable. Not having kept the rest of modern research, their profession has fallen largely into disrepute. I am hoping that this college will try to remedy this grave defect and restore Ayurvedic and Unani medical science to its pristine glory. I hope that this college will set its face absolutely against all quackery, Western or Eastern, and that it will inculcate among the students the belief that the profession of medicine is not intended for earning fat fees, but for alleviating pain and it, it seems to me that in these last remarks, the cognitive dissonance is overcome and Gandhi challenges correctly all the various kinds of doctors. Some Western type doctors whose medical expertise he esteemed. They included Ranji Van Mehta, a good friend for more than 40 years and a fellow vegetarian. Gandhi's esteem for his medical savvy predated his interest in medical in nature. Thomas Allenson, an unorthodox MD in London in the 1890s who deeply influenced him and advocated vegetarianism, whole wheat bread, Gandhi had whole grain rice served at his hospital, exercise, fresh air, curative baths, and no tobacco. Allison said it causes cancer. This was a radical kind of thing to say back in those days. Lancelot Parker Booth, who in Africa in the late 1890s trained Gandhi in paramedical work in a hospital and in the military ambulance corps that Gandhi led. The next two slides suggest how well Gandhi recalled many years later some kinds of information which he expected to be of use in an ambulance unit during the Second World War 
one, general anatomy, including description of the internal subdivisions in the abdomen, the prominent bones, the arteries, and the veins. Two, descriptions of the ordinary wounds, such as are sustained in the battlefield and the various kinds of bandages on them, on the skull, so on. Three, tourniquet. Four, the method of treatment in the absence of medical apparatus. Five, primitive remedies in the absence of medical aid for drowning, snake bite, and scorpion sting. Six, stretcher drill. drill. Seven, marching by thousands in regular formations. <coughs> Exercise. Then he adds, it may be that something is being omitted in this list of mine, prepared for memory. Most of it is covered in the book written by Kettle. Many things are also to be found in St. John's Ambulance. We did have all these books in our library. Okay, Vidhan Chandra Roy, a top figure in the development of Western medical practices in India. Mut Mukhtar Ahmed Ansari, after whom a ward in Charing Cross Hospital in London is named. It is well known that he and Gandhi collaborated on political matters. The next slide shows that he was also sometimes directly involved in providing health care to Gandhi. This is a, a urinalysis report by Ansari himself. He did a series. M.D.D. Gilder, a cardiologist who on several occasions between 1932 and 47 attended to Gandhi and Kasturba and went with them into detention in Pune during the Second World War. Jivraj Mehta, who was, as many people here in Gujarat surely know, no less prominent than B.C. Roy. The next slide is about an autogenous vaccine for Kasturba, which was prepared at Jivraj Mehta's request in 1939. There's his name. Yeah. On the next slide, we can read some of the details. How much of each thing? Streptococcus, Rhychococcus cataralis, three thunder, 12 doses, jacking up from six to 300, every four or five days, an injection. Yeah. This is very modern medicine in those days. Yeah. And Sushila Nayar, who influenced Gandhi just as much in the 1940s as Allenson and Booth had in the 1890s. Soon after Gandhi's assassination, she went to the U.S. to study public health at Johns Hopkins University. The next slide shows her together with the mentor there, Paul Hart. Gandhi, when released in 1944 from detention, was in such poor health that he seemed likely to die very soon. It would have been impolitic for the Raj if he did it while in detention. He then wavered as to what kind of medical treatment to see. Gandhi told a friend on 30th November 1944, Ramesh is a very nice person, but he failed to reveal the wonders of Ayurveda to me. He is hardworking. He tries to compete with allopathy. A great deal of diligence and experience is required to compete with allopathy. I have grown very weak. Sushi LeBay, of course, recommends her line of treatment. I am still keen on getting well with the help of Ayurveda or my own methods of treatment. Let us see what I decide to do. A day later, December. Dr. Shishila Nayar assures me that there is nothing physically wrong with me except that my old friends, the hookworms and the amoeba, have not left me. And this from a letter one month later, five weeks, 4th January. I am weeping what I sowed, reaping what I sowed. I went on taking Ayurvedic medicines without thinking and had to suffer the consequences. I am now getting rid of the poison. I am daily improving and getting stronger. He was, of course, unaware of the numerous 21st century case reports of heavy metal poisoning due to ingesting such medicine. It's all on the net. But he knew his own case history, and he had by now a wealth of observations of Sushila as a medical practitioner whom he could never suspect of greed, as she had never charged anyone a fee. She had been correct and effective about how to deal with the cholera at Sabergram in 1938, etc., etc. She was in my humble opinion, the first lady doctor. My experience has been that Ayurvedic doctors are unwilling to have their wares subjected to double-blind testing, which I used to be in a position to get for them, even though I am not a doctor. 
And such testing is indeed very expensive. A sensible compromise in the U.S. might be to subject those wearers to phase one testing, that is, testing to determine at what rate a given substance can be ingested without doing unacceptable harm, and to inspect for production quality, and then to let the ones that apparently do no harm be sold just as freely as diet supplement pills are sold, yet with some restrictions on the claims about them that are allowed to be made in the advertising. That would be a reasonable middle path for the U.S., I believe. Gandhi's book, Key to Health. This was a thoroughly revised version dictated to Sushila during their detention in Pune of a book by him on health which had been published in 1913 in installments in Indian Opinion in Gujarati. Here is a list of the topics covered in Key to Health together with the page numbers in the first edition of the English translation. The human body, air, and so on. If I have two hours, we could go into these details, yes? It's a lot of material. Condiments, bad. Condiments, bad, yes? Opium, very bad. Tobacco, oh, I'm pointing the wrong place. Opium, tobacco, bad, yes? Brahmacharya, good, yes? Look at that. Four columns, Brahmacharya. That's on the problems. Now, cures. Earth cures, part two, cure. Earth, water, Akash, here, and Sushila didn't know how to translate it, maybe ether, sun, and air. It was due to the, to the heritage of traditional Muslim theory that Gandhi thought of organizing the discourse in part two under the five headings of earth, water, Akash, that Sushila was at a loss to translate, sun, Medieval Western writer sort of said fire and air. So it's the medieval four plus this. Uh, okay, his clear grasp of the benefit of getting enough exercise. Here's the kind of thing he would say. You found it. Or me. Apart from working on land, the best form of exercise is walking. Our fakirs and sadhus are very healthy. One reason for this is that they are always walking and so on, so on, so on. They walk. To be worth the name should cover 10 or 12 miles. Those who cannot do this regularly can take long walks on Sundays. In 1947, he said, and this is worth harping on now that so many of us spend an unhealthy amount of time sitting in front of a computer screen, that for a person engaged in intellectual work, to do also a substantial amount of daily physical work will serve to improve even the quality of his intellectual health. Okay, his focus on hygiene. This is generally well known here in India. Less well known is that the characteristic but artificial boldness of the Mahatma was originally for the sake of his personal hygiene. At the outset of his first jail term, he noted with satisfaction that in the prison, the latrines and bathing area were washed and disinfected daily, but he was nevertheless worried that he might get scabies and that is why he had his mustache and, and the hair on his head shaved off. He had often looked quite handsome before that. <clears throat> from the 1920s on, he took guidance from George Vivian Poor's books on rural sanitation, books with titles like Essays on Rural Hygiene, <clears throat> colonial and camp sanitation, dry methods of sanitation, and the earth in relation to the preservation and destruction of contagion. In just a moment, however, we'll come to Gandhi's enthusiasm for mud cures. His vegetarianism. This also is well known. A quick example of his views is that in 1942, he estimated as follows, the foods required daily by adults of sedentary habits. Fresh fruit, according to one's taste and purse, but preferably including the juice of two lemons or limes, vitamin C. Two pounds of cow's milk for other people. Six ounces, as measured when raw, of cereal grain, wheat, rice, large wheat. 
three ounces when raw of cooked leafy vegetables, five ounces when raw of other cooked vegetables, one ounce of raw vegetables, that is salad, some salt added afterwards according to taste, not in the pot, afterwards, one and a half ounces of ghee or else two ounces of butter, and one and a half ounces of gourd or sugar. Sensible. While living in Morda in the mid 90s it sounds to me like good low cost research. The folks in Lagan Wadi were sensible leaders, not poor men. His critique of medical methods, cruel to animals, or otherwise contrary, in his view, to the spirit of vegetarianism, not only vivisection and the deliberate infecting of sentient beings for research purposes, but also vaccination. Hundreds, maybe thousands of other people were active in the anti-vaccination movement. It was, in my humble opinion, a tragic mistake here at Sabarmati where children of three members of the ashram died of smallpox during the six weeks before the salt march. And yet Gandhi defended on the very same day their father set out with him on the march his opposition to vaccination. Sometimes he argued that vaccination was ineffective, but the real reason for his stance was that he thought the vaccine was obtained by a method cruel to cows. In that light, it is ironic that according to J.S. Hallwell's detailed account of the manner of the inoculating for the smallpox in the East Indies, 1757, the account was addressed to the College of Physicians in London, Hallwell was a fellow of the Royal Society, there had been in Bengal an elaborate widely practiced and prevailingly successful Indian method of obtaining and administering autogenous vaccine to prevent smallpox from becoming fatal. If only the Brits hadn't suppressed the use of that method in India, and if only Gandhi had known about it. His practice of nature cure featuring hydrotherapy and mud cures, he never stopped admiring the books by Louis Kuna mainly about pure debating, and Adolf used, mainly about mud cures. Gandhi's interest in nature cure was due to resonance between some of the arguments in those books, some of what he had learned from Dr. Allenson, and his own observations. He discriminated. In a part of the autobiography praising nature cures, he said, those who purchase Eust's book on the strength of this chapter should not take everything in it to be gospel truth. A writer almost always presents one aspect of a case, whereas every case can be seen from no less than seven points of view, all of which are probably correct by themselves, but not correct at the same time and in the same circumstances. And then many books are written with a view to gaining customers and earning name and fame. Let those, therefore, who read such books do so with discernment. I doubt the claim that Kuna's hypotherapy was natural. He and his clinic are shown here. Doesn't look natural to me. The kind of mud cures that Adolf Just sold would be relatively more expensive nowadays as real estate costs are relatively greater now than they were a hundred years ago. However, in a recent issue of the journal Nature, Bio, uh, Nature Microbiology, there is an article about a newly discovered class of antibiotic extracted from microorganisms living in the soil. This class, dubbed malacidins, allegedly kills certain superbacteria without engendering resistance. When Gandhi was battered in 1908 by someone who felt he had compromised too much in negotiating with General Smuts, quote, the healing of the wounds was slow and he got impatient. He told Joseph Doak, who was looking after him, that if he could get a plaster of clean mud on his face, he was sure it would help. So off I was sent, Doak's son, with spade and bucket to clean away the topsoil and get uncontaminated lower earth for the plaster. We made the mud plasters and my mother applied them. Well, do we remember the consternation of the doctor? <laughs> But in two days, Mr. Gandhi was sitting out on the veranda in the study armchair and eating fruit. 
which he couldn't do before because of his patient rules and privilege. It worked. Even though Gandhi in the 1940s came to trust Sushima's knowledge and skill more than that of any non-Western type healthcare provider, he nonetheless thought that nature cure methods could be of great use to poor villagers. The next few slides provide some details. In 1944, he said in his native Gujarati to a colleague who was dealing healthcare-wise with an epidemic in the village, you will soon get lots of drugs, but they will not be very helpful. Revive people's knowledge of nature cure remedies. Local medicinal drugs should be made available. Give rice water. If you mix jaggery with it, it will provide more energy. Provide more energy. Teach people the rules of hygiene. If food is stopped to people suffering from pe fever or diarrhea, and they are put on boiled water, more than 50% of the cases will recover. That's smart. Help. You must have received the suggestion sent by Kishore Lai Bai and Sushi Lepani. I have suggested only the simplest one. Making space for both. Yes. In 1946, he spent nine days in a certain village setting up and directing a nature cure center, which he then left in charge of a designated medical instructor and a designated administrative manager. His medicinal notes from that stint have been preserved. Here are some of the instructions he left for carrying on without him. The treatment is to be limited to sun bath, hip bath, friction bath, kuna bath, mud poultice, massage, and fermentation of hot water. However, Ramanama is the king of all treatments. This latter kind of treatment could, I think, work only for Hindus and people with great faith in the Mahatma, not for most Muslims, etc. For them, some other ways of making good use of their cultural heritage to stoke up their psychosomatic resilience would be appropriate. Here are some excerpts from Gandhi's comments in regard to a few of the clients, villages, treated during the nine days of that period. I would advise this. She should take sun bath at noon, followed by hip bath and a friction bath in cold water. The diet should consist of only fruit juice and milk or butter milk. She may possibly be cured if she has faith in Brahma. If she does this much regularly, she is sure to get better. Complete cure is rather difficult. Prognosis. Yes. Urine will pass regularly if he is seated in hot and cold water by turns. He should drink boiled water and take fruit juices and buttermilk for nourishment. I am in my 80s. My daily Tomilzosin and Dutasteri tablet, pricey though it is, may well cost less than with preparing tubs of hot and cold water to sit in. What is the use of removing cataracts from a poor person's eyes? One should live with it. Recite Ramanama, and when the time is up, depart with Ramanama on one's lips. If this cannot be done, she may be taken to a hospital and have the cataracts removed. I do not remember any nature cure treatment for cataract. Did she come yesterday? She should be given some bath even in this heat so that she perspires and the boils dry up. I feel that she might derive some benefit if she lies down naked with a wet towel on her head. While doing so, lying down, she should constantly utter Ramanama. She should be given all this treatment here. We ought to clean up the boils for her and bandage. She should be advised about her diet. A very sick lady. I don't see any way to reconcile that advice about the cataract with his famous talisman for constructive social workers to the effect that they should try to improve the lives of the very poorest. Gandhi's advice with regard to that old woman reminds me of the fact that a top British economist, Lionel Robbins, in an article entitled Interpersonal Comparisons of Utility, 1938, cited a statement allegedly made by an anonymous Brahmin to the effect that he, the Brahmin, was ten times as capable of happiness as that untouchable over there. <clears throat> Robbins argued that to regard different people's basic needs as being of equal importance would be, alas, unscientific, though ethical. Well, medical science is steeped in ethics, as economic science should also be and a responsible doctor's decision as to how to proceed in a complicated case, 
is often based on an informal estimate of a client's resulting quality of life. Maybe that old woman was weak enough to warrant postponing a cataract operation, but to rule it out categorically looks to me like a mistake. How can a two-year-old child be allowed to suckle? He should be given only fruit juice. He needs an enema, which can be done only here. Make the necessary arrangements. I happen to know that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, born in 1882, was nursed by his mother until he was four years old, and he served as president of the U.S. Why had she tied to her abdomen? In the first place, she should not gird up so tight. She should lie prostrate and naked in a solitary place. She should give up eating bread and subsist on milk and fruit. Does she pass stools? With whom has she come? Does she have anyone at home? Very often it is indeed, in my humble opinion, important for the doctor to know about those latter kinds of things. The most effective treatment for rickets is sun bath and taking milk mixed with fruit juice. He must get himself admitted to the hospital. If he is willing to do that and wants to have a note from us for the hospital, he may go with one, provided by us. There is no other remedy for hernia. His strap belt also be worn. If he does not want to do this, he should surrender to Rama and rest content. There's a good deal more. It seems to me that Gandhiji was learning what it's like to be a primary care physician obliged to prescribe lots of treatments for strangers. His use of fasting as a nature cure technique. The long essay of 1913 includes the following remarks. We shall now consider remedies for these four diseases. Blah, blah, blah. Treatment should begin with a 36-hour fast. And Kunabath should be administered during and after the fast. Now the word fast as a noun or verb has often been used without saying clearly what is meant. According to a review article written by two MDs in Berlin and published in 2013 in the journal Complementary Medicine Research, fasting is the voluntary abstinence from solid food and stimulants like caffeine or nicotine for a limited period of time. It depends on the person's ability to meet the body's requirements for macro and micronutrients during a limited period of either shortage or absence of food by using almost exclusively the body's energy reserves without endangering health. During fasting, intake of food in forms of vegetable broth and vegetable or fruit juice should not exceed 500 kcal per day. And when fasting is done properly, one should experience a good level of vitality and absence of hunger. Gandhi's concept of fasting for health was not so poorly delineated. Cutting down on one's nutritional intake in order to help cope with a fever harmonizes with the English proverb, feed a cold, starve a fever, and with a recent Yale University study opposing effects of fasting metabolism on tissue tolerance and bacterial and viral inflammation, 2016, which implies that it's good to eat well if you have a cold, but ample nutrition may aggravate a bacterial infection. The study was based on cruel experiments with mice, not people. But even so, maybe Gandhi was on to some valid traditional wisdom in Indian as well as Western culture, which Western medical scientists have been slow to appreciate properly. They never prescribe fasts, almost never. Yeah. However, in 1925, Gandhi advised readers of young India to fast if you are constipated, if you are anemic, if you are feverish, if you have indigestion, if you have a headache, if you're rheumatic, if you're gouty, if you're fretting and fuming, if you're repressed, or if you're overjoyed, then you will avoid medical prescriptions and passive medicines. I imagine he knew, of course, about the Ayurvedic tradition of Lanka. That is, the fasting for a day or so, perhaps once a month, or even once a fortnight, in order to maintain good health. Yeah. His teaching that chastity is essential to good health, I disagree. But I would willingly grant in an honest debate that some important aspects of his marriage improved, as he would later recall, have been the case, after the vow of chastity in 1906. 
and I would as an ecological economist agree that an increasing rate of promiscuity among teenagers in the U.S. in the latter part of the 20th century had among its unfortunate, unfortunate consequence and anything goes attitude of unbridled consumerism and ecological recklessness, sex and everything else. Okay, you see, teenagers freed, yes? Recent sociological studies indicate, however, that rates of pregnancy, consumption of alcohol, cigarette smoking, etc., are significantly lower among teenagers in the U.S. today than had been the case among their parents. Something remarkable is going on nowadays among youngsters there with mobile phones. We see that in the politics. But still, I think it was tragic that Gandhi rejected in 1935 Margaret Sanger's request that he support the cause of the NGO plan, that Planned Parenthood, which she had founded in 1916. She came to India to make the request personally to him. He did, in 1946, recommend privately the use of condoms to a member of his ashram. The story is too long to tell here. Two key points of it are that Sushila told Gandhi that the man's attempt, not always successful, to practice chastity was endangering his wife's sanity. Sushila confirmed this to me 50 years later. And Gandhi had compassion for that lady. The evidence is clear in some of his extant letters to her and to her husband. Gandhi had strong, explicit principles and could thus be dogmatic at times, but since he was essentially a karma yogi, empirical considerations could be very important. Some examples of how he would sometimes set aside his own dogmatic inclinations. There are several examples in addition to the one I've just mentioned. There was, for instance, the time in 1946 when he led a biologist whose moral stature as a social reformer he greatly admired, Gandhi had said in a letter to that man, though there is a resemblance between your thought and practice and mine superficially, I must own that yours is far superior to me. He let that man slice open a living frog in order to teach nurses the same grown about heartbeat. Amazing. In the severe conditions of malnutrition and epidemic in India toward the end of World War II, Gandhi sanctioned substantial exceptions to his precept of vegetarianism. In 1944, he told a health care worker in a village stricken by an epidemic, to meat eaters, she may unhesitatingly give meat soup. Soup means water in which meat has been boiled. Boiled. That these things could be served hot after boiling them should be. This is not the time for doing our religious duty of propagating vegetarianism. His approval and use of euthanasia. The actual use was on a cat. The approval for humans was unequivocally clear and was categorical if, quote, recovery is out of the question and the patient is lying in an unconscious state in the throes of agony. He should not, in my humble opinion, have said in an unconscious state. It seems to me that if the patient is in the throes of agony, and if recovery is out of the question, then a conscious state should be no bar if the patient has expressed a clear preference. His choice of palliative care for Kasturba in February 1944, which he was very sick and weak, he was himself personally attending to her personal hygiene. And the doctor said that maybe a series of injections of penicillin could defeat the infection. An hour or so before her death, he declined to, quote, drug her even on her deathbed. She died as she wished to do, with her head on his brow. That is palliative Books that he's known to have read on various other health-related topics. An important one was <clears throat> Chukugandas. Motichan Shah, Mane Shikama, maybe based on Shabas's advice to mothers. Gandhi recalled in the mid-1920s, I studied the things necessary for safe labor. I read Dr. Tribhuvandas's book and I nursed both of my children according to the instructions given in the book, tempered here and there by such experiences as I have gained elsewhere. My careful study of the subject in Dr. Tribhuvandas's work was of inestimable help. Gandhi performed the functions of midwife for the birth of his last child. It was a difficult delivery, by the way. Also important, 
was at least some of W.J. Moore, a manual of family medicine for India, and maybe some or all of Alexander Ambrose's everyone his own doctor. In a letter sent to a colleague in 1934, Gandhi said, I want a good guide for village workers to be written. The conception is to produce a book after Moore's family medicine or everybody his own doctor. Now, the following notable facts about health care in the U.S. were published last month in the New York Times. Although hospitals account for about a third of all medical spending, there were <coughs> this sector of the economy has actually been in decline in the U.S. for some time. There were, in 1981, over 39 million hospitalizations, 179 admissions per thousand Americans in 1981. 35 years later, the population has increased by 40%, but hospitalizations have decreased by more than 10%. And the number of hospitals has declined from 5,500 this, uh, this year to 5,500 this year from nearly 7,000 in 1981. This is because hospitals now seem less therapeutic and more life-threatening. In 2002, researchers from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimated that there was 1.7 million cases of hospital-acquired infections. It caused nearly 100,000 deaths. Hospitals are dangerous. And finally, as I mentioned in the outset, on these concept of corresponding duties, the performance of which bestows real value on theoretical rights. He said that a political manifesto demanding a right is incomplete without emphasizing the necessity of performance of the corresponding duty and showing what that duty is, and that in the matter of improving one's health, lethargy is a sin. The human body is both a kudokshetra and a dharmakshetra. Insofar it is a dharmakshetra, it is one's duty to keep it in good shape. And I would like to see such a concept brought into the current debate in the U.S. and not have to I will skip ahead. This is a manifesto in the U.S. that says nothing about duty. That's the point of these two slides. Gandhi always insisted that avoiding disease is far better than getting and curing it, and it's important to be clean, control your diet, get substantial daily exercise. He, stood quite well that the, uh, he understood quite well that the natural function of our limbs is to perform physical work and not take more medicines than you really need. This seems to be such a vital message for affluent people today that the preventive health care provided to them should, I think, be designed to impress them more effectively with this message than it currently does. But that is a key question. How to get them to pay attention and take it to heart. Let me mention on propos my main theme of making good use of the cultural heritage of Gandhi's message. A fact pivotal to the haggling between people in affluent countries who say things like the American way of life is not subject to negotiation which is what President Bush said in Rio, and the people who, ins and, and, and who insist that the less affluent countries are overpopulated. That's one. And B, the people in the densely populated countries who say that the big current and forthcoming problem of the Earth's declining capacities to provide the natural material goods and services needed by humankind is due to excessive per capita consumption and waste in the more affluent countries. Right? You know this. The fact which I want to mention is that those two factors, population size and rate of per capita consumption and waste, are equally important. It's a case of A times B equals C, where C is correlated with the resulting ecological damage. It is not NA times B equals C with N equal unequal to one. The one times the other. They're absolutely equal. It's crazy to point out the one without pointing out the other. Now, we don't want a rapid population decrease. Indeed, one big goal of healthcare is to prevent that. But a fairly rapid decrease of the per capita devastation factor could be achieved if the people consuming and wasting at above average weights would tone it down. They shouldn't, however, hide their virtue. They should try to set examples in such a radiant and yet clearly feasible way, radiating moral common sense, that it might calmly persuade other people to follow suit in their way. Goodness knows we need better crowd psychology than the economists cultivating us with their bull and bear markets and the resulting extremes of Ponzi schemes and panics. 
It seems to me that doctors should convey an implicit message, and sometimes explicit, since they have medical authority, of, look, I'm doing this. You do that. Medical authority to get the patients to do their corresponding duties. And here's a great example of them making more than 700 physicians and medical students in the Canadian province of Quebec, members of a group called Quebec Doctors for Public Health, have recently signed a petition saying in French, we, Quebec doctors who believe in a strong public system, oppose the recent salary increases negotiated by our medical federations. The money should go to the nurses, not to the doctors. Here are two lists of some things which I think ought to be done in the U.S. and in support of which Gandhi's message can be cited. I will tag the lists micro and macro by analogy with the corresponding distinction in economic theory. Micro, that is for clinicians, take time and exert effort to persuade clients of their duty to maintain health as best they can. Wield more medical authority in advising them about proper hygiene, exercise if they're in want of it, nutrition, obesity, big problem in the US, you know, the dangers of various narcotics, and maybe even the doctor talking about the psychosomatic benefit of a good moral condition in relation to society. A spiritual slant like that would certainly be gone here. Since part of your job is to help induce many patients to attain and maintain a healthy level of weight, don't be fat yourself. Review the sets of pills being taken by affluent elderly patients. Take time to explain about not taking antibiotics for a viral infection such as a cold, etc. Talk up when appropriate the human organism's self-restorative capacities and never prescribe a more expensive pharmaceutical or procedure if a less expensive one can reasonably be expected to work as well. Make house calls to poor people who need them and practice and advocate palliative care and euthanasia, both of which, as I have shown, are demonstrably dead. Macro for public health officials, this is just a tentative beginning of the list, ramp up primary health care and render it more feasible for physicians to get to know their patients by, for instance, letting primary care physicians in hospitals average three appointments per hour, not four or five as they're nowadays routinely ordered by the hospital directors to do. In 2010, 23% of the primary care physicians in the U.S. were working in hospitals. In 2016, it was 43%. By now, it's probably most of them. Let them have three appointments. 20 minute average, rather than 10, 12, 15. Take advice from and update the information in David Trickle's Medicines in the 21st Century or Bill's Politics, Potions and Profits, Where is Public Policy? And prohibit it. Drug development research and prohibit all forms of pharma salesmanship in med schools. It is a poison, a social poison that penetration of the med school atmosphere by advertisers. Develop capitation schemes of payment for health care. In a capitation scheme, payment is not for appointments and procedures, but for overall provision of health care to the individual for one or more forthcoming years. This would be feasible with a national single-payer health insurance scheme such that the insurer reaps monetary benefit from having the clients maintain good health. Capitation is the way for the U.S. to go. Yeah. But we can't do it without single payer. Tax increasingly the purchase of tobacco, sugary drinks, and alcohol. And there's a recent big article about that in the lesson. And finally, evaluate quasi on Gandhian ideas and accept or adapt some of them from various more or less unorthodox MDs in the U.S., such as, uh, mostly in the U.S., I have one journal, Andrew Weil at the University of Arizona, Bernard Mohn with his, quote, The Lost Art of Healing, Otto Buchinger with his Therapeutic Fasting, all the top German government people go there, fasting to lose weight. Sharmila Mutgal with her high-tech team at Avita Biomics at Harvard University, Gilbert Welch at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice, and Sheila Patel with their integrative medical consult consultations at the Chopra Center in California. Different aspects. 
This is last is yoga for you. This last. This is all in the U.S. except for Otto Buchinger, uh, uh, who has a German. It's a German thing. <clears throat> to summarize this talk in a nutshell, I would say that Gandhi had a deeply felt vocation to heal. He wavered between nature cure plus some uses of Ayurveda and standard Western medicine, and yet finally trusted Sushila more than any other one. However strong his precepts, he would yield sooner or later to empirical evidence, as we must all do. And some of his ideas are indeed relevant to problems of health and health care nowadays in the world. I noticed that very few people left and I presume that those who left had something very urgent to do. So now we open the floor for questions and discussions. They are invited to him. the 21st century, female of the species are allowed to speak in public. <laughs> this talk will probably go on the web next to the longer essay, which is now 189 pages long. Why is it long? at uh, uh, GandhiFoundation.net. So, any feedback, please. How do you look at the most of Obama care government policy in the US? Well, we don't yet know how that's going to work out. I personally think the big question is that the Republicans will want to uh, put Mr. Trump on trial before this November to get him out before the midterm elections, and the Democrats want to keep him in until December so they can get control, control of the legislature, and if they do that, uh, there's no telling. I think Mr. Trump will be in jail within five years. Uh, he's so crazy and um, you know I won't talk about it. <laughs> Mr. Trump is crazy. Mr. Modi is crazy like a fox. There's the difference. Mr. Trump has so heavily overplayed his hand. So there's no telling how this is going to work out in the US. However, Obamacare is in my humble opinion deeply flawed because so much of the money is going into the insurance, going to the MBAs, yes? <clears throat> I have a friend who is very up on this, chief advisor to one of the best private healthcare programs. The average amount of time that a middle class American stays with this or that insurance company is less than three years. That means the insurance company has no interest in the long term health, only interest in postponing the treatment for a couple of years. You see, under that, you get incredible wastage. With single payer, you have the, 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 the rationale for telling, for, for uh, doing everything correctly for the patient, especially persuading the patient, getting to know the patient, persuading the patient to do the right thing. A lot of middle class illnesses are due to misbehavior by the patient. Alcohol, more in my parents' generation than now. Yes, tobacco, which is winding down in the US, and winding up in other countries. We have an incredible painkiller uh, narcotic uh, epidemic in the US, and other drugs in the US, and then the obesity in the US. Now, the, the whole profile is different, but this profile is amazingly due to failure of the patients to do their corresponding duties. And they're not even beginning to talk about it. 
in England. The National Health Care people put out corresponding duty messages every week. You see. So we really need, uh, basically, Obamacare is better than before, but we need to go over the single payer, and uh, we'll see what happens. There's no predicting how politics is going to go to the U.S. <laughs> in the U.S. So when you say post-Obamacare, who knows? Yep. Those are my, that's my general view of what needs to be done. With single payer, we can have capitation, then the emphasis can be where it ought to be on primary care and preventive and the patients getting to know the patient. You, you want to know the patient's religion, the patient's deepest beliefs, so you can relate your advice to the patient. You want to know the patient's family situation. Now, in this modern world, there is so much migration taking place within countries and between countries that the old idea that you have a family doctor for all your life, that idea is just fading away gradually. Yes, half the primary care physicians are, are in hospitals now. So that's a problem that has to be dealt with. But the way to deal with it is to let the new primary care physician have good notes electronically, digitally, about the patient's medical history, and then take some time to get to know the patient, and then take that extra time at the end of the appointment to say, my friend, not all your health will be better if you lost weight. I really want you to do some weight. I something to take the extra time. It takes time. And the doctors today, they're looking at the watch because they've got this 15 minute limit. They should, a 20 minute limit would be a significant difference already. No. So, I'm sorry, I, I bent my answer to your question into a harangue about something a little different. Yes. I don't know how it's going to go, but I think single payer is, is the, uh, not to be done in the next two months, but in, in the next five years in the US. Did you just explore the potential of homeopathy or cow urine therapy? Cow urine or homeopathy? Therapy? I, I don't know anything about cow urine therapy. Okay, you find me a doctor. I I am not talking about India. I am this question, a guest. This question is that we explore some of you. You yes, but you find me uh, uh, a, a, an MD who has done some research on it. We need statistics. Let me just bring in an interesting fact here, which uh, Anikwai will know well. When you want to get uh, FDA approval in the US, approval of a new pharmaceutical, uh, in the final test you have not dozens, but hundreds or even thousands of people, double blind test, the new drug, all people, two groups of people, similar degrees of health, same disease, yes? And one group, in each case, they get a pill of the new drug, and the other group gets a placebo. And neither the patient nor the doctor handing out the pill knows which one is getting which. And then you compare the statistics of recovery for the two, yes? Now the amazing fact, everybody knows this, every smart doctor knows this, is that one-sixth of the patients who get the placebo recover from the disease. It is psychosomatic. It is real. Psychosomatic. One-sixth. Now, you can't... How to plan that is a mystery. Every doctor knows it's true, but it's real. And I'm sure that Gandhi used that. That is a well-established fact. So therefore, you come back to all of these treatments that the Westerners haven't accepted. It's because they haven't got the statistics that show that it's, because you can always find an anecdote among that one-sixth. You understand? Yeah. That's the general, would you agree with that formulation? Yeah. Ladies? Yes. Well, Maynard, yes, please. Of uh, medical uh, in India and elsewhere, or some other 
separate stream for me to start it. An MD ought to be doing what I've been doing. Yes? Yes, of course. Now, I, my daughter is an MD with also a doctorate in epidemiology from the same university where Sushila got hers, Johns Hopkins. I have some good friends who are doctors, so I know a little something. But yes, it needs people with more medical expertise, this discussion, for America and for India. It needs people like Sudarshan Rai, who, who, can, and, uh, who can do the medical economics, study the, what is proposed in India and so on in relation to these problems. But we also need genuine expertise from MDs who know about public health. There are good books in India, at least one very good book in India, when, if you want to talk about India. And in America, we need the same kind of of, of expertise. Yes, there has to be MDs coming into this. I did it because I'm, I'm interested in it and I'm very interested in Gandhi and uh, so I brought it to this point and now we need more people on the team. Yes. Yes. You are right. Please. So you spoke about uh, natural cure. Natural cure. There are quite a lot of crusaders in the US and the UK. Yes. MDs who are talking about it. Yeah. Uh, but they're up against millions of dollars that pharmaceutical companies throw at this. So, in the nail on the do you see a very safe solution to this? Well, these are our voices fighting against hundreds of millions of dollars. Of course, sir. Mostly, these alternative practices cost less money, especially at the pharmaceutical end. Yes? I mean, drugs cost fantastic amounts of money. They're very essential to Western medicine. What Gandhi didn't know was the chemistry. The chemistry is the basis and the biochemistry of the pharmaceutical entry. It's absolutely central to Western medical practice. And I'm taking, you know, I'm taking pills. So I have a couple of cancers, and I've, I've had pharmaceuticals, so I'm grateful for them. But they cost them fantastic amounts of money, and not everybody can afford that. So alternative methods, and Gandhi showed that something protecting the doctor's interests, so its whole mission changed. Yeah. So nothing is simple in the human body. It's extremely complicated, and therefore medicine and healthcare is extremely complicated. Gandhi. Gandhi was able sometimes to cut through these complexities in a, in a, in a, in a brilliant way. Uh, so I hope that my answer, though not exactly very coherent, is satisfying to you. Yes. I thank you for your attention. It is such an honor to be speaking in this I am a card-carrying atheist, but this is a holy place. And it is a great honor for me to have addressed you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. We realize that you are an atheist and this is a place of faith. So atheists can afford to have faith. There's they are not contradictory in nature. Uh, I'm sure it has sunk in and it will take some more time to sink in. And people will keep thinking about it. And in this series of Sabarmati lectures, this has been the second one. And thank you for joining. And we also hope that you will keep coming when we hold these kind of open fora for discussions on these kind of subjects which also closely relate to Gandhian thought framework and his life. Thank you very much.